Um, it is a, a, a lovely small group we've got with us tonight. Um, welcome to all of you. Um, thank you for joining us for Leo's winter term kickoff. Uh, my name is Christy Schultz, and I'm the assistant dean academic here at Faculty of Extension. Uh, you probably receive emails from my robot, um, but probably rarely from me, but every once in a while. Um, I just want to um, provide a few uh, notes before we begin. First, I want to acknowledge that we are um, gathered today on Treaty 6 territory, uh, traditional lands of uh, First Nation Métis people, and, um, uh, and we are grateful for the opportunity to gather on these lands and to provide that land acknowledgement. Um, I also want to uh, direct your attention to the emergency exit. Should we go into an emergency situation, uh, please direct your attention to the nearest emergency exit, which is right here. Um, and then the actual door to the, to the outside world is just to your left. Um, and where you came in will also be a bathroom. Um, a few other things. I want to uh, thank all of you for being here. And Sandy, who is uh, another one of our instructors, who didn't know that we were uh, going to be telling so well at the end of her class today, is probably also going to be joining us in a few minutes. Um, but I want to thank you for your work um, as instructors at the Faculty of Extension and for bringing your insights, your wisdom, um, to our students, to our learners. Um, and we know that it is that relationship between instructors um, and students that really does make a difference in the world. And it's why we all do the work that we do for those of us who work here at Extension. Um, you are in for a treat tonight. Um, the two presentations that you'll see, first off is Alex Lomas, um, who is going to be presenting on how not to, or a few tips on how to hopefully not get hacked. Um, and I have uh, enjoyed this presentation in the past, and it is a treat, and it is uh, terrifying. <laughs> um, so perhaps uh, someone less terrifying and more exciting will also hear from uh, Lana Whiskey Jack uh, tonight, who uh, is a um, uh, remarkable storyteller herself and will be bringing us um, ideas about um, thinking about, I can't remember the entire um, title of the presentation, but will be bringing us ideas about um, uh, Indigenous knowledge and reconciliation in the classroom uh, through art. Um, and so, uh, She's, and if you don't know uh, Lana Whiskey Jack um, and her art, I recommend that you look her up on the internet. Um, her, <laughs> um, her website showcases uh, her, um, her paintings, um, as well as some of her other creative work, and it's really remarkable, so um, you will enjoy her talk as well. Um, again, thank you all for being here today, um, and uh, I look forward to joining in for as much of these sessions today as I can. Alex, over to you. Thank you very much. Okay, yeah, as was mentioned, we're going to talk a little bit on how to hopefully not get hacked. So a little bit of backstory about myself. So my name is Alex Lomas, I use he, him, and I've got a background, I've got a um, Bachelor of Science in Computing, which means I can, I'm not an expert on computer security. There are people who get doctorates in this and they're not experts in computer security. It is a really big field. But I can tell you how to lock your door. Uh, I can't tell you which bank vault to buy or even which brand of door lock is best. But that's OK. We don't really need to worry about all the nitty gritty most of the time. Um, so the reason I said, you know, hopefully and hat is because at the end of the day, this is all a numbers game. And there are a lot of people. There are a lot of people with a lot of accounts. So we're going to do our best to make ourselves as small and varied of a target as possible. It's sort of like you know, outrunning a bear. You don't need to outrun the bear. You need to outrun the other person. So, and the reason I say hacks is because actual, you know, they injected SQL into your mainframe GUI and got all your passwords. That's not really a thing that makes any sense. What is way more common is stuff like this. Is so the former not a thing? The latter of hey, look, someone leaked the emails and passwords from the Smash Mouth message boards. Let's try them all on Venmo. That happens all the time. And so this is a comic called XKCD, which I absolutely love, and that'll be important in a second. And there's a little website here called Have I Been Pwned? So who's feeling brave? Okay, we already tested you. All right. Can I get your email address? My email address? Yep. One here, maybe. Sure. It's Lipka at... Uh, how do you spell that? 
LIPKA, sorry, PKA, yeah, at Alberta, whatever the university ones, I never use it yet. All right. Oh, you might Oh, okay, so chances are pretty good you're going to Well, no, I've used it, but I mean, I, I, I work for the city, so I, that's the one that's in my head, so I can give you that one. Okay, <laughs> hey, good news. No, you no. haven't been pwned. Okay, so that one, uh, so, and the important thing to note here is absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. So just because, so what this does is it searches a whole bunch of what are called pastes, which is where somebody says, hey, look, somebody leaked all of the Smash uh, passwords, and then they just shove them all online. Alex, you got to put mine in there. got to put, okay. <laughs> <laughs> which one? Um, my U Alberta. Okay. Uh, uh, so S. Also good news. Do you have many accounts with that? Pardon me? Do you sign up for many things with that? I sign up with nothing for it. Oh, well, then there you go. Try my try Christy, not show. So I didn't give Alex, I didn't, I, but I, after the session that Alex had given, I went and I checked. Christy, not show, thank you all for that. SCH. And okay, so three different breach sites. Can you tell us? Oh, that'll tell us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like I said, and you can even search through, hey, let's have a look at all of the different websites that have run into problems over the years. And this is exactly why you don't want to use <clears throat> your, the same website for Smashmouth as you do for your bank account. And I mentioned that was XKCD. Even they had half a million accounts stolen. It happens. There's no way to avoid this. It's just a part of life. <laughs> so what do we do about that? We use things like password managers. So I myself have about 400 different um, passworded accounts, which you all probably have a similar number. I worked in IT for a bit, which meant that I had to sign up for a whole bunch of things. So you might be around half that, but you have way too many to remember. When people have too many things to remember, they rely usually on just using the same thing over and over again, which is how we run into exactly those problems. <clears throat> and yeah, even before I found out about things like this, I did that too. It's, it's okay, it's not a shame thing, but let's you know, get better. So what a password manager is, is it can store all of your passwords behind a really secure password thing. I use something called LastPass, which is free, it's cross-platform, I've got it on my phone, I've got it on my computer. Um, you can even share it with people. In fact, I think it's set up so that if I die, my spouse gets access to all of my stuff. I can't remember how they'll know if I die, but, you know, that's handy. <laughs> In fact, even Have I Been Pwned is itself an ad for another password manager, but the whole idea is you shouldn't even remember what most of your passwords are because they should just be a bunch of gibberish generated by something else that's all stored in one spot. Any questions so far? Yeah, it's a super handy system. So what you've probably noticed is anytime you enter a password, your web browser is all like, hey, do you want me to remember this? Yeah. yeah, which is a form of password manager, and it's certainly better than nothing. However, web browsers are notoriously not great at password management in that they're a lot easier to crack than something like this, which has built its entire reputation around this. And LastPass is like a really big company that relies on companies trusting them. So it's the sort of situation where their backing relies on this not being an issue. So at the end of the day, though, you're going to have to remember at least a few passwords. I myself have five. There is my computer, my at-home computer login, my work computer login, my personal email, my work email, and my LastPass password. So I need to have at least five that are both easy to remember and very secure. So if you don't need to remember it, just go with like 20 random characters. It doesn't matter. That's 12 is usually good, but hey, why not? Um, if it does matter, then don't make a password. Make a passphrase. And the reason for that is because there's two types of hacking out there. At least there's the two big ones, where somebody actually has a list of what's called hashed passwords, which is <clears throat> stuff has been done to them to make them harder to get into. But there's the brute force and the dictionary attack. Brute force is they try A, then they try AA, then they try AAA, then they try AA, blah, 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 blah. And we're getting to the point where that's billions of tries a second. So just to give you an idea of scope. And then there's a dictionary attack where they'll try, you know, Aardvark, and then Armadillo, and then just go through the dictionary. And this will include, like, other languages, and it'll probably include things like Klingon and stuff like that. So a single word isn't actually that helpful. So 
we're going to play a quick game of which of these do you think is easier to crack? So we've got trumpet. And this fits with the common idea of a way to make a great password is you want to make sure that you've got things like numbers in there. So we've got a zero and a three. We've also got, you know, there's a capital T, a capital R, and there's an exclamation mark at the end. And then we've got things that historically have been told, hey, this is actually a bad password. So trumpets, trumpets for life. All lowercase. All, um, you know, we've got a couple spaces in there, but that's actually just to make it easier to remember. So who thinks that the first one's going to be easier to crack? Who thinks that the second one's going to be easier to crack? Okay, yeah, about middle of the road. So the more important thing is who can 100% guaranteed remember what the first password is? Okay, who can remember what the second one is? Yeah, exactly. And that was on there for all of like 10 seconds. I was talking over it. You weren't paying that much attention. So the, in, the important thing to note is there's actually a pretty big difference in how hard these are to crack. And that's because the sheer volume of things you put in there is way more important than how much variance there is. Which is why go for a passphrase. And they're just way easier to remember. There are a bunch of different password things, by the way, out there that'll tell you how hard it is to crack these. I just went with the most doom and gloomy one. So what's the reason that so much harder to track just because of the length? Yeah, the just because of the length of number of characters. Every time you add another character, it makes it exponentially more difficult to guess that. Adding in a variety of characters also does that, but variety of characters is a lot harder for a human brain to remember. But you said that uh, dictionary, there is a dictionary-type uh, hat, and that would be much easier on the second one compared to the first one. True, but those aren't designed to string together random words. Yeah, it seems like when we've been asked to put in passwords, we're asked to be put in uppercase, lowercase. We're asked to do the first. Yeah, we are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, and that's because all of that's been built on essentially uh, misguided information, which is really frustrating, but that's where we are right now. So then you're going to have to take your second version and <coughs> add a number and, a, and an exclamation point or something at the end. Yep. Because it won't, like, like I can't change my city one, they won't let me because it has to have those other elements. Mm -hmm. And if you want to know a secret, and don't tell anybody I told you this, but you can just put an apostrophe into a lot of words that we normally use, and it's called a contraction. And that works. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's another thing which is worth knowing about, which is phishing. I had a question. Oh, yeah. Like, right at the start, you had a phrase on the right-hand side in that cartoon. I didn't understand any of it, so maybe just because I'm still... Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Like, I don't know what uh, Smash Mouth... Oh, sorry, Smash Mouth is a band. <laughs> so, Smash Mouth is a band. So, just, you know, a forum for where people are talking about their, you know, favorite Smash Mouth albums. It's a band? Yeah. It's not the Beatles? No, not the no. Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a little more reason. <laughs> but I think there's a pretty decent chance that they're closer to the Beatles than they are to now. Yeah. 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 Venmo is a banking application for sending money to people. So it probably doesn't matter that much if somebody hacks your Smash Mouth account. It matters a lot if somebody hacks into your Venmo account. So the question I've been told by IT experts you should do online blanking because no matter how secure they tell you it isn't as secure as they say it is. Is that true or not? It's sort of a that horse has already left the barn situation. Whether you do anything with your money online, your bank is doing stuff with your money online. Yeah. I mean, I'm not suggesting you log into an open Wi-Fi called Honeypot and then enter in your banking information. A honeypot is a name for a thing that's designed to steal people's information. It's because flies go to a honeypot. Anyways, um, but no, it's fine, more or less. And keep in mind, this is because banks are very interested in making sure that you can trust them. So even if something does happen, like your credit card information gets stolen, which somebody stealing your credit card is way more likely than somebody managing to break through a whole bunch of security, um, then most banks will be like, hey, we noticed that you bought a bunch of weird stuff in Iran. This probably wasn't you, right? So at a certain point, human systems come into play. But yeah, hopefully. <laughs> Once we get a bank on, mm -hmm. 
<laughs> so you know what? I don't think I've been in the bank. And Yeah, they have, they have a vested interest in not having to pay people to deal with your money. But yeah, thank you for bringing that up. But I don't know if it's on track, but you know, it's nice to have an expert. Like we're giving out our credit card information all the time and even the, the numbers in the back and stuff like that. And I'm always concerned how much we have to use that all the time now. Is there any tips or... Suggestions. Does that fit? I'm sorry if I'm off topic, but does that fit in with your presentation? Um, can we talk about that at the end, just if there's extra time? Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, other thing worth knowing about is phishing. So the whole point of phishing is based off, you know, phishing um, is the idea that they're trying to get as many bytes as they can using fake information to get you to basically click on a link, enter your information somewhere. It used to be a lot more common that it was click on a link so a virus will download. Uh, Basically, everybody uses virus protection, so this is less of an issue, but still worth keeping in mind. But let's go to the Google phishing quiz. And uh, heads up, this one's real hard. So let's do me. Uh, so let's start here. So from Luke Johnson. Luke Johnson shared a link to the following document, you know, department budget. Hey there, here's the doc you asked for. Let me know if you need anything else. How do I feel about this? It doesn't have his name. Doesn't have his name on it? That's true. And department budget, emails of that kind don't start with hey there. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. It is pretty That's casual. So what's nice about this quiz is it's fairly interactive. So we can look at a couple things. Um, so within Gmail, if you click on details, it'll show you some extra stuff. So this is luke.json8000 at gmail.com. OK. Suspicious? Does that seem right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK. What do we think? Should we call that phishing? Yeah. 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 And correct, this is a phishing email. So. One of the things we notice here is actually if we had if we had hovered over that, that's a fake link. <clears throat> Drive hyphen hyphen google.com is not the way to get to Google Drive. It's the way to get to somewhere else that will then ask you for more information. Mm -hmm. Hey, you received a one-page fax. Now that this is me, I would guess phishing immediately because I haven't sent a fax since. <laughs> oh, jeez. They were great for connecting with Grandy because it just printed for her. That was about it. OK, I'm going to guess phishing. And correct. So if we have a look here, we see it's at efax.com. Blah, blah. All right, we need some audience participation. How do we feel about this? Yeah. Yeah, somebody sends you that. And important to note here, so drive.google.com. OK, we're good so far at that point. Download.photo.sysdes.net. Whatever comes at the end there, those dots, that's where it's actually going. So this is not going to drive.google.com. It's going to sysdes.net, which we do not trust at all. So what happens if you keep clicking on it? If you keep clicking on that, you will either get sent to a virus or you'll get sent to something that says, hey, we need you to re-enter some information. If you've ever gotten an email, and chances are pretty good you've got 30 of these in your spam inbox, that says, hey, your account's about to go dormant or we need a little bit of extra information, please enter it in here, that's exactly what those are. And as soon as you do enter that information, you probably feel fine about it because this says that it's legit. And It'll take, and even if it takes a few minutes, already some robot has tried that on 800 different sites. Because they're, because they're predicting, and not unreasonably so, that you've reused a couple of these passwords here and there. OK, we're going to do one more, and then we'll move on. And yep, sysdes.net. OK. Dropbox is full. So what should we be looking for? You're the experts now. Hmm? Yeah, let's check the details. 
Okay, no reply at dropboxmail.com. It's not comfortable because the mail doesn't belong. If you hover over the button, Oh yeah, let's hover over the button. Upgrade to Dropbox. It goes to uh, dropbox.com slash buy. So it does go to dropbox.com. There's, to the best of my knowledge, no way to spoof that. So that's actually a thing. I think it's a little bit worse. Yeah, we're, we're running with the simulation, not the real thing. Okay, phishing? Legitimate. Okay, we got some calls for legitimate. Correct. Yeah, that one's actually legit. We, we checked the email. Yeah, it was Dropbox. We checked the link, dropbox.com. All right, excellent. And I encourage all of you to check out the rest of this quiz. So. Another handy dandy thing is called two-factor authentication. So what this means is that when you try and sign into something, usually in a new spot or just at all, it'll require you to get another thing to confirm that you are indeed the person. Um, quick story. So there's a there's a gaming system called Steam wherein you can you know play games uh, on your computer using that. And for the longest time, it kept emailing me and been like, hey, we noticed you're trying to sign in from Malaysia. Is that you? And I'm like, definitely isn't. Let's change my password. About every three months, this had happened. Then finally, I'm like, all right, let's turn on two-factor two authentication. So what that means is now anytime I want to sign into that, it then texts me on my phone to get me another code, which means I have to have my phone in hand in order for me to actually log in. No longer do I get those emails, so no longer is somebody trying to log in there, which means that problem has now been solved. Steam is a pretty, you know, low stress environment, but this is super handy for emails, anything else where you're worried about confidentiality. And in fact, even you can set it up for your online banking, which means that anytime you want to log in your bank, you need to have that phone in hand. Somebody on the other side of the country could very well have your password, but they won't have your phone. Any questions? Cool. And lastly, there has never, ever been a legitimate reason for somebody to ask for payment in the form of iTunes gift cards. But that Nigerian prince story sounds... This sounds <laughs> legit. There, okay. was, there was a hack that was going for a phishing uh, scheme that was asking for iTunes gift cards or something like that. They came from Haiti and a bunch of other... So many hacks. And a bunch of other uh, university senior administrations. They just spoofed the emails and sent it out. And there were a number of staff members who got caught up in it. I don't oh, know dear. if there were any actual iTunes gift card purchase given as payment, but there were people who believed that it was real and were concerned. Mm -hmm. And one last quick moment. You'll sometimes see phishing scams that go entirely the other way and are like really clearly obviously bad. And that's because the people that fall for them are those that will fall for everything following that. Which is funny until you remember that largely means people who aren't that technologically literate and are your parents. So keep that in mind. Watch out for them. OK, cool. Thank you very much for your time. today about uh, using art, but I'm actually going to be kind of doing what I'm talking about by sharing um, a lot of images and less text. And um, so at any time you have questions, don't, don't hesitate to um, 
to oh. Oh. Um, so I'm Tanse Kekia Nwagamakanak and Lana Whiskey Jack Nitsigasa on Excapolnia I'm Lana Whiskey Jack. I'm from Sally Cree Nation. And um, I'm from oh, I'm from I work here <laughs> as assistant professor since 2017. Wow, over two years now. Um, I always appreciate to um, my language, which is Cree, because when I introduce myself, it's it, I'm I'm kind of uh, acknowledging my my roots, my ancestors, my connection to this land, um, and it's important to also uh, remind me of where I come from, but also honoring the. The work I do now and how it will affect future generations. So it's kind of introducing myself in my language kind of brings that uh, energy to what I'm doing. Um, the root word for my name is and my I am from in Cree is Utsi, which is belly button. So it's interesting if you go, if, if you, any of you uh, know any indigenous people, a lot of indigenous people from Turtle Island. We always ask you, who are you? Where are you from? Who, you, who are your grandparents? And so, um, when I when I answer myself, in some weird way, we're going to find out how we're related. And so that that um, kinship is in our language. And so, uh, and as crew people, obviously, it comes from we're matrilineal people because I'm connecting my myself to the belly buttons I I come. From. Where the wombs I come from, and so um, I wanted to. I I posted showed these pictures. I usually change them every now and then. Uh, this is my chop on my great grandfather Mumstop and my great grandmother uh, Maggie Small Face. Um, this is taken probably in the 40s when our ceremonies were still. Uh, outlawed, and so my great grandfather was one of the elders in the community who actually took the ceremonies underground. We, we hid them; we'd be thrown in jail, locked up, uh, if we were found practicing our, our ceremonies. And so this is um, a picture of my grandfather with my my grandmother, his daughter. So that's my mother's mother, and uh, again, identifying uh, the the family I come. Does anyone know where Sad Lake is? Sad Lake Cree Nation? It's, uh, it's about an hour and 45 minute drive northeast right here. Uh, does anyone know where Cold Lake is? Yes. It's in between there. <laughs> you have to pass, uh, you pass around that area. You would usually have to go around um, Sad Lake. Um, and it's right along the, the North Saskatchewan River. It's a beautiful area. So one of the why um, so I'm going to talk about art in reconciliation, especially in teaching, and why do we even need reconciliation? Well, I already shared with you that our ceremonies were outlawed as Indigenous people, but prior to that, there were treaty signs. We're in the Treaty Six territory. Thank you for acknowledging that. Um, and what does that really mean? Treaty, is, you know, from Canadian perspective, treaties are an Indigenous thing. But for Indigenous people, treaties were actually signed with um, with the intention of sharing this land, the first foot of it, with our, the new settlers and the newcomers to our to our, our land, and uh, and so of course we were sent on to herded onto reserves, which wasn't part of our treaties. That's part of the Indian Act, and um, and then everything they created policies and laws especially through the Indian Act of disconnecting Indigenous people from the land, the language, the children, everything that created our culture, our livelihood, the laws and policies of Canada helped to create further uh, destruction to that. Hence, we're in a place now of, I can't even do the math right now, my brain is mush, but since 1876 to when the first apology was made by a Harper government in 2008, and then followed that with the Truth and Reconciliation, of course, which ended in 2013, 15. Thank you. Yes. And so, 
you know, when the for a lot of indigenous communities um, that I know a few of my elders, they call reconciliation reconciliation because it just further created divide between communities because a lot of racism came up. And being Sad Lake, um, we've had <coughs> decades of uh, boycotting St. Paul, the nearest um, community, uh, because of the amount of racism. Uh, recently, it was on the news because uh, a man, a 72-year-old uh, retired police officer, was threatening to go shoot up Sad Lake and the school, or in the school in Ashmont, um, to shoot the children. And he just, he's, he's let out on bail and, you know, there's a lot. So that, that still is a daily part of a lot of my relatives' uh, daily experience. One of the biggest things that, um, again, only has been recently started getting known within the communities is around a historical trauma or intergenerational trauma. Again, when we're talking about reconciliation, especially with indigenous communities, is you have to acknowledge this, this historical trauma because of this historical relationship. As, a, as an academic a scholar, a researcher, indigenous researcher, as an indigenous community member, um, one of the, it took a while for me to even get to this place of even talking about reconciliation, to be talking about um, working on building good relations between indigenous and non-indigenous communities. And so art has been a vital part of that process. Um, again, this is the photo of my, my grandmother and my uncle, my mom's older brothers, and my grandfather. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, when my grandmother was the first generation to actually attend Indian residential schools, and so my great grandfather, who you saw a photo of, didn't. And so the school that she attended was Blue Quills Indian Residential School excuse me, by St. Paul, um, and that was built in 1931. Has anyone heard of Blue Quills? No? Blue Quills is um, built in 1931, was an Indian residential school, but since 1971, it uh, was the first indigenous-owned and operated educational institution in Canada. So that's where I got my doctorate, the very place where my mother, my grandmother uh, were suffered a lot of abuse and disconnected from their language, their culture, themselves, because if anything, um, I hear a lot of stories uh, working in that school. Like I have family members who refuse to come into that school. I taught art there for 12 years. And, and so it's, it's, uh, it's a very special place for me because it's one of the very few Indian residential school standing, um, and it's, it's, it's also the place where I've reconnected to language, reconnected to ceremony, to uh, my language and to my family. And uh, I know I'd have family members saying, if I, if, I, uh, if I ever had the chance, I would totally burn that bulldoze that school down. And I'm like, but I, mean, I, would, I would argue that well, I'd stand in front of it and protect it because this is the last kind of reminder to Canada of this history that has been silenced only up until recently, since um, 1996 is when it really came out when the uh, Chief Phil Fontaine of AFN, the Assembly of First Nations, actually talked about his own sexual abuse in residential schools. So. <clears throat> Um, I wanted to show you my first, very first digital story. It's, uh, I, it is, I'll have to give a trigger warning. It does talk about, um, shares a lot about my vulnerability. It's less than five minutes long, but it's, a, it's about, based on intergenerational trauma. And it's about, um, it's about my womb and losing my womb to, to hysterectomy, but my theory of how, as women, we carry a lot of, uh, trauma in our womb. So, oh my goodness, I don't know how to work. I'm a Mac person, so 
<laughs> oh no, what did I do? Yeah, well, and now I got to this, I wanted this page, I wanted to view it. And from that. That's the right spot. Yes. Dan said, my whiskey jack means he got some. My belly button came from the sacred space of many whiskey jack women, Zapa Anak, Nukumwak, and Nigawi, three generations that survived the failed attempts of assimilation and colonization. It was there in that fortress of extermination many of these women learned the shame of being in their own brown skins. It was in the shower room that so many young, innocent, precious areas were scrubbed raw after their first blood as the stern voices of the nuns preached on how the bodies were dirty and full of sin. It was there in those cold, empty rooms, guilt and shame made a home in their sacred areas, all in the name of education. Iskwell, woman, Iskodel, fire. All women were once deemed as sacred beings, gifted with the greatest power to give life. Iskwell, Iskodel, the home fires, the center of the home and the community, fire keepers that kept our people warm and alive. It was there in that brick building that silence was used to kill the fire of our powerful medicine through abuse and humiliation, my blood memory. I was born into shame and guilt. Nikki must have felt disgrace that she kept her pregnancy with me a secret until a nurse from the hospital finally found no come to notify her I was born. I lived in the nursery for a month without being helped by my own mother. My aunt once said, I left that school hating the world, myself the most. I didn't respect my body. Why should I when no one else did? Many of the women in my family had been in abusive relationships. It was easier to accept abuse than love. Go ahead, hit me, Nigga Wee would yell when she was triggered. My first moon time, Nigga Wee held a feast to honor my rites of passage into womanhood. She raised a glass to Lana, my young woman. The male family friends flirted. She's not a woman until she's broken in. Laughter sliced at my innocent to squail confidence. I became a young mother, full of blame and shame, disappointing my family's expectations. When my first daughter was born, my self worth slid into a deep, dark hole as her father pierced my heart. You are just like your mother. Finally, after my third child, fear overcame me that my sacred center could no longer carry the colonial weight of being a squaw. I resisted a hysterectomy for six long years, not wanting to give up what Nuko called my medicine. I was weak, pale from anemia, corrupt with the guilt and shame that my own woman part wanted to abandon me. I returned home looking for answers, only to find out Nuko Lee and Nuko both had long pink scars revealing the loss of their own squid. I too had a fresh scar. My sacred medicine sang back into Mother Earth, wrapped in fruits and tobacco. I mourned for the spirit that brought me my children. I'm still searching for the answers, but do so with the knowledge and deep gratitude that I'm here, alive and strong. I as well come from a long thread of powerful, resilient, courageous, strong, wise, brilliant women. I carry is go tail that ember to pass on the beauty of who we are as my heroic to my amazing, beautiful, strong, courageous, powerful children. My body carries thousands of generations of a square spirit. Is go down. So art is, became a really important part of actually getting to that place to speak about something so vulnerable. But to um, 
part of that process of finding the words to share that was, was through creation of starting with just painting. And so um, when I was first looked at intergenerational trauma that affected me, because I was doing my doctorate and the, before I could do my external work, I knew this was an important part of processing. And I should back up a bit. I did my doctorate at Blue Quills, and Blue Quills' doctorate um, program is based on uh, ceremonies in each of our four uh, seasons. We're quaternity-based <laughs> peoples because everything comes in fours. And so um, I knew when I did my protocol, I offered tobacco. Tobacco is our insurance and contract <laughs> policy um, to, to do the best we can in, 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 in a good way for our future generations and as well as honoring our elders. And so um, ceremony was this important part of, of finding the safe space to do the art and then trusting the art process. And so I had a series of intergenerational trauma paintings. And so this is an example of me processing that work of moving. And so part of the, the, the few points about um, the art process is that it gives you, I call it eagle eye view, uh, but bird's eye view of, of looking at myself and looking at what I, all the connections and relationships that help to get me to where I am today. Um, it's about people don't realize that our creation is a small part of actually the work. A big part is the research and reflection and, and, and the restoration um, that art you do before creating, during, and after. Um, the, when I'm in art, um, it's a place where there's no judgments. I don't even allow myself judgments. I created protocols when I'm creating. And, um, and of course, it helps once I when you're in that meditative state of creating, it helps to declutter the mind, right? All the judgments. When you're not judging yourself, you allow yourself to get lost. And to me, art is my ceremony because I go in and I communicate with, or something communicates through me from a higher, a higher power. And of course, help to connect to spirit and medicine. And that's one thing that really, um, in the education uh, spaces, is that uh, especially through Indian Residential School, my uh, my elder and my mentor, um, the well-known uh, Dene Sillin artist Alec Janvier, would say that those school because he went to Blue Quills, is that those schools were meant to kill the spirit in the child, just not just killing the child, uh, the Indian in a child, but it was meant to kill the spirit. And how many of our our young people died in those schools or died after leaving those schools with no spirit or a broken spirit. And so art is this place of going to restore that spirit, that broken spirit. Um, I wanted just to touch a little bit, because because I'm a woman, I'll speak from that place of being a woman. I identify as a she and her. Um, I'm also a mother. I'm a grandmother. Uh, the picture of the young lady with the belly, that's my daughter, made me a nice young grandmother. Um, and, and you'll see it uh, at the end of that digital story, a little girl, she's actually eight years old now, that's uh, my granddaughter. So I have these extremely um, important roles in my life beyond uh, being a scholar and a researcher and that are, they're actually, she's actually the root of what I do. And so um, I want to make sure that the work I'm sharing is, is going to be um, Added to a discourse of of courage and resilience. Yes. It's not fair to look dirty and have a neat. Thank you. <laughs> we Cree women have some good blood in us. <laughs> <laughs> so my um, now you got me uh, sidetracked. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's that's an important root of of you know when I'm doing this work too is that I want to continue adding to the paradigms of disparity, which you do see a lot. If I were to Google Indigenous women right now, what do you think is the first thing that's going to pop up? Anyone? Yes. Exactly. Murdered and missing Indigenous women. Um, and so, I, as an Indigenous woman, I 
like I said, my family lives with this daily through racism and through, you know, the fear of walking down the street, the street right? Um, so I want to make sure that my work is constantly, and the art I create, creates a space of safety and reminding people of where they come from. So um, this is, uh, is uh, another short digital story. This time I did a digital story collaborating with um, my colleague, that, or she's actually my adopted sister, Dr. Jolene Oje. We graduated both from Blue Quilt. Um, and she's teaching about our, our traditions of the swing and moss bag. So, yay, I did it. <laughs> Oh no. Through our stories, songs, and our lived experiences, we pass along our ways of being and knowing to our children and grandchildren so that they know who they are as Cree people. Our grandmothers tell us that little ones come to us as gifts from spirit world. These little spirits of Zahfusak come through the womb of the woman. During this first transition from spirit to child, they make their journey wrapped in their first blanket, a Zahkagul, spirit blanket, which was set in Cree by Julianne Manage, an old woman from Flats Lake, Alberta and rocked gently to and fro for nine months by the water spirit. When the child is born, we honor and respect them by making their transition comfortable and kind. We do this by replicating the placenta bay with the moss bay and the water rocking by the swing. This is the most sacred bundle we will ever hold in our lifetime, and so our grandmothers have taught us to carry this bundle in the most safe, loving, and strengthening way. We decorate these moss bags beautifully because we carry this gift from Creator in them every day. The moss bag strengthens the spine and protects the nervous system as the brain and other physiological systems continue to develop for another three months after birth. Because newborn babies have not yet developed muscular strength to hold up their heads, and have no control over their nervous system. They are prone to sudden bursts of arm or leg glitches, which could cause potential harm. The moss bag prevents this risk of injury while keeping baby comfortable, warm, and safe. It is easy to pass around a baby when they are in their moss bag. As the baby grows, so does the moss bag in the way that it is made. Our grandmothers also taught us to put our babies into a little hammock cradle-like swing. The baby is rocked gently to and fro, day in and day out, for at least the first three months of their first transition from spirit to child. As we swing them, we also sing to them. This soothing, rocking motion with song is the sacred energy in which the spirit meets the child. The rocking motion is a complete balance for creating a harmonious space for healthy child development. Swinging our babies allows them to continue to be rocked as their brains continue to grow in order to maintain emotional, mental, physical, and spiritual harmony. As people, when we feel stressed or out of balance, we crave motion and will often move ourselves either by self-comforting rocking motions, walking, running, or going for a ride. This rocking motion is the most natural healing state of a human being. In Cree, when someone passes away, we say, they have stopped moving. The baby swing is a warm, loving, comfortable, soothing place and space for our little ones to rest in peace and allow their spirits to journey home, to gather the medicine they need to live the best life they can while on this land. 
When we respect and honor our little ones in this way, we are being good, loving, responsible mothers because we are keeping our babies warm, safe, protected, and loved. This is our role as parents. I always like to tell uh, people that I'm definitely not a watercolor artist. <laughs> it's not my strongest uh, work. Um, so <clears throat> we get to the part where now, of, uh, after finding this balance of sharing my very vulnerable story, was starting to share some of those teachings that actually remind me of where I come from and the. the the beauty in our culture that I want to pass on um, is now how do I share this with non-indigenous communities? Because um, of course I have my responsibility to my own community, my family, my future generations, but I also have a responsibility as you know a treaty member, members. And so <clears throat> um, I, I uh, as part of a documentary done at, at Blue Quills on the circle process that we teach within there. And um, Beth Wishart McKenzie, it's called Gently Whispering the Circle Back, um, the film that she created based on that, uh, on the circle process at Blue Quills. Um, I showed her a piece of my, um, I'm, I'm actually trained as a ceramic sculptor. It's my background, it's not in painting. I picked that up when I was doing my left brain studies at Carleton University on my undergraduate program. So the face of that uh, sculptural piece called Lost My Talk is uh, just a terracotta. And, and so um, she asked me after she finished the film if I, she can watch. She used to, uh, I talked about art as part of my healing and uh, reconciliation, or part of my healing. And so the, she created a film called Lana Gets Her Talk. I don't like the title. It sounds a little too, I don't know. I don't like it anyway, but she's the director. She won. Um, and didn't want to. I actually challenged her to a game of Indian leg wrestling, <laughs> but uh, to, to change the title. Did she didn't want to like it. <laughs> she didn't want to change it. Anyway, so she spent four years. It took me a while to actually finish this piece, and it's based on my uncle, uh, my favorite uncle, who actually lived off the streets here in Edmonton and in Vancouver. And uh, I use it as a teaching piece. It's one of those pieces that I'll never sell because it was just something that helped me through, again, through that when I was doing a lot of the trauma work. It was one of those pieces where it just brought this bigger perspective to my mind. Because one of the biggest things of doing that digital story in this piece in my three generations was that I realized I didn't, that my, it wasn't my family's fault. As, as a young adult, I blamed everything. My mom did this, my mom did that, you know, my family, the dysfunction, all of that. When I did those, I was like, oh my God, these, this system created this community, this family, this, this, you know. So <clears throat> these, that's the importance of that art creation. And, I, and so the film talks about that whole process. And so it just finished and our last tour stop was in Vancouver. It was touring across Canada for the past year and a half of having these conversations. And um, you can go to the website. It's called Peak Square. I guess I can pop it. I can um, show it. Uh, PeaksquareSpeaks.ca. And um, or you can Google Beth Wishart or Lana gets her talk, and you'll be directed to that <laughs> website. And so it's. It's, uh, it, it became a really great way of talking, having really difficult conversations with people across Canada. I was really happy that a lot of, um, majority of the people in our audience were non-Indigenous and sincerely wanted to learn more about the history of Indian residential school and reconciliation and all of that. And uh, in this piece, which is now a triptych, has been one of the a really, um, a haunting piece of um, making people stop and think 
And of course, when I tell the story of my favorite uncle who taught me how to throw punches and knives, and and you know, about the same time as the stereotyp stereotypical indigenous person of living off the streets, he was angry, he was an alcoholic, all of that. But at home, he was this beautiful, kind, loving uncle who 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 wanted to give me skills to survive out of the reserve and out of the family. So. <clears throat> Creating the art helped to develop my language to speak. It helped me to actually carry my own stories of, of trauma and resilience. And um, like I said, like the painting helped me, the artwork helped me to uh, create a bigger picture. This is just a little more detailed of what's my top of, of that. Um, one little thing, uh, of course, I, I'm a multidisciplinary artist. I get bored, not bored, I just like to try and constantly experiment. So um, this is called devouring pizziguas. Apple, apple is a derogatory word for a lot, or a lateral violent term used in my community of when you leave the reserve, you go get educated, you come back here, your, your language change, you may look, you know, you become a city girl. It's your red on the outside and white on the inside, especially if you get educated. So this is me deconstructing words that have power over me to be able to, um, so it won't affect me anymore. So now when I get called out, but when I go back home, I'm like, I know where it comes from. By pro again, by processing it and deconstructing it through the art process. And that's what happens when you actually um, step out and start speaking up, is you become a target for lateral violence. This, so this theory was pretty important in, in helping to to uh, move through that and not carry lateral violence. Um, so when I first did my research, focused on intergenerational trauma, the art helped to evolve it, so it became intergenerational resilience that I, I work on. So the intergenerational trauma part was all about me. And so once I was able to carry my stories, um, I then was asked to start carrying other people's stories. So I did a research series on indigenous beauty. And the interesting thing about asking, I'm like, OK, I've got to get away from this trauma talk. Let's get in to talk about resilience and our power. And you know, I was all excited to, to finally you know, move beyond that conversation. So when I started interviewing indigenous women, asking them, uh, how do you define beauty? When are you in your element of beauty? And when how do you contribute and maintain the beauty for yourselves, but for others? Well, every single one of them <laughs> started with their trauma. They, wouldn't, they couldn't talk about their beauty without talking about their trauma first. And so I did these five huge paintings, their largest paintings I was working on at that time, in oil, which again is something I never really did much of. And uh, I'm not going to show this this digital story, but you can find it on my website. And it's the um, a beauty of MJ, who's the Métis traditional artist who lives here in Edmonton. But um, so that is one of the uh, uh, teachings about that is is when you liberate yourself to share your vulnerability with others, and um, they're able to, and you speak about, it, and the way you speak about it. You give a safe space for others to speak about theirs with you, and and you know, incredible things happen from that. So resilience isn't about enduring like pain and well, that's part of it, but it's also as much about as your self-care, taking care of yourself in order for you to take care of others. And so this is a quick little story around this. So this is my auntie, my mentor. Uh, she's a medicine woman. She went to residential schools, but didn't, uh, they didn't teach her how to read and write. So that's one of her, again, her sharing her vulnerability about and uh, had horrible experiences in residential schools. So she, um, she actually loved my series, Apple series. And she wanted me to, and I was asking her, when do you feel most beautiful? And I have a huge painting of five by seven feet of this, uh, from this image. I took photos of women who wanted to have photos taken of in their elements of beauty. So my aunt here, of course, feels most beautiful when she's on the ground with Mother Earth, when she's by water, when she's in ceremony and praying for others. And 
Uh, you can watch her beauty sir on um, Lana Whiskey Jack YouTube. I have them on there as well. And so, but she wanted um, to replicate her five-year-old self in residential school, and she wanted it at so she collected everything that kind of resembled what she looked like as a five-year-old. And while I'm taking these photos, I had like silent tears coming down behind the camera, and I was shaking, watching my auntie who's in um, in her <laughs> and uh, replicating her traumatic childhood self. I was like, yeah, I get goosebumps still thinking about like seeing her, and we took about 150 photos of uh, different positions that they always learn in school. Of course, the little girls always had to stand like this, prayer, um, curled up, you know, crying to bed, which is many kids went. All of these, and she did it with such courage, and it was incredible, you know, from wanting this photo, you know, to go with this photo. So, again, kind of wanted to end um, talking about like uh, how we bring, how I bring these tools into the work, into my teaching and learning here, is by first placing myself sharing who and where I come from, sharing those stories that I just did throughout this presentation, and through those, you know, taking that other medium of digital stories and artwork to be able to speak about things that, you know, are very difficult to, to speak about, even for a lot of people to hear about. Um, you can read all of the comments at peaksquay.speak.ca of people who, um, well, after watching the film, seeing the art, and their reflections around reconciliation. And uh, it gives me a lot of hope. It's not so much about reconciliation, but how you know people have the ability to, to, to move past or you have to have those hard conversations. And having those hard conversations, people are able to evolve and move from them. And so, um, as I mentioned, Alex Javier, who went to Blue Coles Indian Residential School, uh, came to paint there a lot, and I was, he often bossed me around, and still does. Um, and he, we were talking about, um, blue, he always told me stories about blue quills, and, uh, and he would always keep telling me to do art. And I quit my job at blue quills to actually, I was listening to him to go and do art. Um, so yeah, he would say, Lana, if you want to paint something ugly, make it beautiful. So it kind of just reflects that whole, um, process, art process, of, of moving and constantly evolving through your work and helping to evolve conversations through sharing that work with others, through our education, our teaching and learning. So thank you very much for sitting here with me. <laughs> um, any questions? Comments? Yes. I, I just wanted to, um, well, to thank you, but also to reflect on uh, the idea that you're presenting here, because I think in uh, so much of the teaching that we do, um, in, uh, e even beyond the kind of work that you're doing, um, uh, it's sometimes we're teaching difficult things, mm -hmm. um, and we need a way into those things. Um, and it strikes me that one of those ways in, in is through story and through that personal connection to those to those different. Difficult conversations, but I'm thinking even you know through uh, some of the classes I've sat in in OHS, um, you know there is a way in, and it's and it's often personal, and this is just a really um, good reminder of that. And um, so thank you for that. You're welcome. Thank you. Yes. So a question for comments. So I was going to make comments. I thought it was all standing. Oh, oh, thank you. Yes. I just want to thank you for the presentation as well. It brought a lot of great memories back for me because um, I actually lived in New Zealand for 10 years. And so I used to work for Auckland City Council there. And that's because I was originally from Canada, born in Toronto. Um, as, a, as a foreigner, um, we had to take Maori training. And so it was great. So I learned so much about Maori culture. And you started, you introduced yourself. That's exactly what Maori do. They, they talk about their moana, their mountain, their river. Um, uh, the Waka, which is the ship they came over from from Hawaii, um, well, the Hawaiian area. Um, 
to New Zealand. Um, so yeah, it was, it was really, there's so many similarities between so many indigenous cultures. It just brought back a lot of good memories. So I just want to thank you for that. You're welcome. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, great stuff. Thank you. Ooh. Any other last thoughts? All right, then. Well, thank you again for inviting me today. Uh, much appreciation. That's it. Thank you. Thank, thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd be remiss if I didn't thank Brian, Collins, and Kim for their work in bringing us all together. Uh, for